All right, so I'm going to start in a couple of minutes. So I'll just give an introduction. So this, this talk was a last minute edition. Um, many thanks to James and Stephen for, um, for offering to give this talk. And it's about something that we've, we've discussed a little bit on weekly development calls before, but we haven't really had a structured proposal. Um, and now this is the, the structured proposal from James and Stephen. And um, I've also got confirmation from Stephen that uh, he and James are, are going to put the effort in to make this all work, which would be great. So, <laughs> so you. James, I'm going to hand over to you and um, yeah, looking forward to your talk. Right, so Stephen and I haven't figured out exactly how we're going to handball across, um, so I might just end up starting and stopping my video. Um, I'll be running the slides. Stephen's going to walk through the slides and basically use this to start a conversation. Um, we do have the, the skeleton of a proposal in there, but the intent is really to use this to kick off a conversation, not to, to be a, an absolute end point that we're saying this is what we're going to do. Um, we very much do want other people's input. So with that, I'll um, flick over to Stephen. All right. Um, yay. First presentation. Go us. Um, yeah. Thanks, everyone, for coming along. So um, yeah, our proposal is basically it's what we're calling user, user alerts is the terminology we're using here. So um, what we want to do is alert the users of RG Pilot that there's an RG Pilot issue that affects the safe operation of a vehicle. So any any of those sorts of fairly um, serious issues that can uh, result in a user, um, I suppose, losing their their vehicle or their vehicle doing something fairly unsafe. And by issue, we mean sort of a software bug or similar within the um, RG Pilot code base. Um, next. All right, so why? What, why do we need this? Um, a few reasons. Um, first, we need a robust way to communicate these sorts of things with both users and um, regulators. Um, secondly, the users need, they need this information in a timely and accurate manner. Um, it's no use if a user goes on the forum or Facebook once a week to see a critical issue that um, would have affected them many days ago when they were flying. Um, they need to know this information very quickly if it affects them. And um, with social media in particular and the magic Facebook algorithms, users may not always see those sorts of posts on Facebook or Instagram or wherever people are posting these sorts of things. Um, thirdly, um, a single source, single source of truth. Um, there's just, there's one central place where, which has the consistent information about the issue. And, um, lastly, the ability to track the patching of the issue so that the users are aware about when the, when the issue has been fixed and, um, when it is safe for them to fly. Um, next slide. So our proposal. Um, our proposal is a central repository where these sorts of safety bulletins slash user alerts are managed. Um, a documented process for um, drafting, releasing and um, closing these issues. Um, for the most part, we're not going into the te technology um, choices for this repository. Um, pure, we're purely looking at the, um, the processes and um, I suppose what and how to, how to run this sort of thing. And we'll figure out the mechanics and technological issues further, further down the track. Um, one dis technological decision we have made is that it will be machine readable, some sort of JSON or XML format. Um, the reason for this is we want any sort of um, 
software to be able to read and pass these issues quite easily. Things like allowing GCSs to alert the user automatically if there's an issue, if, there, if there's a safety bulletin out for the current firmware or vehicle that they're running, as well as allow other websites to grab the data from that database and display it. Um, examples of this would be like um, bots or so forth that could auto post these issues on the forums or on Facebook and so forth. Um, next slide. So um, we're up to the discussion point of, of this. Um, in order to, I suppose, make this sort of proposal slash idea work, we really do need some sort of buy-in or agreement from the development team um, so that you know everyone will actually use it. Um, there's no point in having this process if only sort of half the bugs get posted there and so forth. Um, so what we'd really like is to get the agreement or not agreement, more just the buy-in from all those, from the developers and those in the community that um, what they'd like, what sort of shape they'd like to see this take form. So we've got some discussion points here. Um, sort of first, sort of, sort of we've got the process for releasing the safety bulletin slash user alerts and um, what data should be captured in these, which we think are sort of the two, the two starting discussion points for these. Um, so what will happen here is we're going to take questions or comments from all of the participants if they feel strongly one way or another about this. And um, what James and myself will do is we will take notes from this and um, we will use that to refine our proposal and then we'll after the conference, we'll go back, refine things a bit. Then later on, we'll come back with a formal proposal for the um, RG Pilot dev team. So um, yeah, if anyone's got any comments or questions or discussion points about this, um, yeah, just let us know and um, we'll um, unmute you. You are posting the side chat. I can't see that with the screen share. So um, just please speak. I up can. You. Yeah. So Stephen can see those questions. He'll read them out. Um, I also can't see when people stick their hand up to unmute. So um, we'll just have to do the best we can. Uh, Randy, you had a point? Uh, yeah. Um, and by the, by the way, is it okay if I turn on my video while I'm, while I'm talking? I guess that's okay, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, I think this sounds really great. Um, I was just going to say on the Arctic Pilot version, uh, I guess there's sort of two two things, two parts. So there's like when the bug was introduced and when it was fixed. Because sometimes, um, you know, sometimes it, it could be since the beginning of time, but others, you know, we, you know, um, introduced this bug accidentally in you know, three six ten or something, uh, fixed in four oh three. That's the there's sort of like an input in version where it appears, and then you know, a version where it's fixed, maybe. Yeah, absolutely. Last version which has it. Yeah, and it's, you need to be able to say which vehicles it affects and what type and what under what conditions it affects yeah. a, a vehicle. Because uh, we've quite often had some very specific bugs, like for example, only affecting if you're using F port, only affecting if you're using the FR Sky telemetry, not to pick on Alex at all here, um, or only affecting, you know, if you've got certain types of um, hardware. Um, and um, ah, uh, me, Peter has got his hand up as well. I just noticed. There you go. I'll unmute. Um, oh, can I mute myself? Uh, how do I unmute okay. you? Two. Oh, uh, there you go. Yes. Uh, just uh, saying the way we uh, encourage people to determine what uh, firmware to install in their RD pilots is via the manifest.json uh, uh, file. Yeah. So it would appear to me that um, using the same mechanism to warn them that the firmware they're currently running is faulty might be the best way forward. We just need to find some convenient mechanism of getting that data into the manifest.xml or manifest.json against each firmware. Yeah, and that's one of the architectural decisions, I guess, that um, we wanted to discuss. So the manifest.json um, does seem the most natural way to do it. Um, whether we inject this into manifest or have a separate JSON feed, 
that doesn't have because that JSON um, is a massive um, file, really. Because um, it um, so it might be better to actually have a separate JSON feed that people can subscribe to. Um, the, yeah, I, I think it should be a separate file. Um, it could potentially be linked, and um, if we had like a like a CV number, you know, a if we assigned a number to a security alerts, and then we could have the number in the manifest, maybe to say which ones it's potentially suffers from. Um, uh, that would be that'd be worthwhile. But then I think the ground stations should fetch the actual. Uh, alert separately. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's. Um, Thank you. We got Michael O'Born here at all? No, he hasn't managed to do it. It's rather early for him. No, he's, uh, he's in Geelong now. He's not in, not in WA anymore. Oh, okay. All right. So anyway, we, I was thinking about discussing how we do this in Mission Planner because it'd be really nice for Mission Planner to be able to display it. And would we display it every time they load a firmware, or would it? Because ideally, it would sort of warn them, warn them that their current firmware that they're running exactly. has a problem. Um, so that's absolutely the intent: is not to spam every user, um, but to 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 pass the, the firmware version they're running against uh, these user alerts in the background and only pop up a warning if it actually affects them. Um, and it really should only pop it up once because the, the user should be able to dismiss it. Um, and but there probably should be a button for them to bring up all the current alerts, uh, yes. the current release notes yeah. for the stable releases. Yeah. Um, and it could, you know, that they could sort of tick that I've seen that one, you know, and and don't show again. But you should then be able to like untick them to say, I'd like to see all of the alerts at the moment. Yeah, um, um, I mean, that's very much a, a UI kind of um aspect to this, um, which is probably the next step. Um, but definitely working with, with Mark and Don. Yeah, we'd work, work we'd work we'd work heavily with the GCS type people on on this. Yeah, the there? main ones, Mission Planner and QGC, obviously. Them. Sorry, Randy. Yeah, no, it'd also be nice to um, to have like a link as well. So, um, you know, when the when the GCS goes off and gets information about the you know the issue. You know, from the Artifact server, or whatever. If it also can get a link, so that we, you know, that that link is sort of our, um, you know, we control the, um, you know, the information, the content of, you know, that the that the user sees. So, you know, um, you know, like maybe a link to the GitHub issue, maybe a link to something else. I'm not sure. Maybe a, you know, link into the wiki. I think like most that. of the time, I think we should probably have an alert section in the wiki. Because often we want to link things like a YouTube video, or you know, to say how to work around the problem, or detailed screenshots and that sort of thing to see if you're having the the issue. So I think if we had a section of the wiki for yeah. safety bulletins, and the link was into a specific safety bulletin in the wiki, I think that would that would work well. Yeah, I mean that that comes with a maintenance overhead, of course. I um, mean, yep. we need to either all like that. Um, like GitHub is so much easier, you know, GitHub issues are so much easier to, you know, to type away on and you just close them and open them and stuff, whereas yeah. the wiki is a big so process. Um, I think with with the dissemination of information to the GCS is that, that JSON feed or XML will be decided to JSON. Um, GitHub is the natural place to do that. Um, well, we don't necessarily want the full discussion. If we're just trying to present sure. a safety bulletin, the GitHub issues tend to have all the discussions and yes, I've reproduced or I can't do this. All the yeah. comments come in and that's not what we want to present to users who are out at the flying field and trying to decide. Right. We want yeah. the one authoritative piece of information. So we'd have yeah. to lock mm -hmm. the issues. Um, yes. Well, you present information you need people to see inside the yeah, JSON. Just Tell um, the users that don't don't fly or don't use this mode. That's all really they need to know. But I mean, well, if we use the GitHub issue, it would have to be a, either a locked issue, or it would have to be in a separate repository. Um, what well, I think actually, you know, we don't necessarily need to <clears throat> um, rely on the GitHub, uh, you know, issue or whatever for the content of what the user sees. Correct. It's just I, I was just really just suggesting that we have a link so that they can get more information or. You know, yeah. they, they want to drill down into it, but it, but the JSON file itself, I think, has like the stuff that the user's gonna, you know, see on their little pop up on the ground station. Yeah. That's, um, that's 
Yeah, got a few questions or comments from the chat here, which I'll just go through one by one. Um, from Buzz, make sure the alert contains a Git issue number in Gitash. Um, yes, we'd like to yeah link back to um, the issue and the pull request on GitHub as well, just to um, help with the tracking. Um, what else is there from Buzz? List of parameters that have to be set a certain way in order for it to be a problem. Yep, if there's a certain set of parameter parameters that cause the issue, um, yeah, yeah that would come down come under the description or mitigations about use this or don't use this. Um, from Mike Dornish, um, as an aircraft manufacturer, I'm wondering if there is a way we could run out own repository, maybe include our own specific safety bulletins or choose not to include bulletins that don't apply to our aircraft. Um, I think it'd be great for more more people and more, more of the community to be involved. Um, I suppose there's two ways to do that either. So if we, we can have like a field, um, we, you could like... You're yeah, you'd you'd probably be more eloquent. <laughs> um, yeah, so Steve and I did discuss this when we were going through, you know, some concepts a couple of days ago. There's two kind of concerns and two things that make it hard. One is that our department needs to be very, very careful that we don't start assuming responsibility as a project uh, for things that are specific to manufacturers. Um, so we we are yet to work out a. a in our own minds, a clear way to, to make that distinction in this process. Um, but we do need to find a way to do that um, so that manufacturers remain accountable for, for, uh, for what they do with their vehicles and with Argy Pilot. Um, the other thing is if you are using your own firmware, then it's going to be very difficult for Argy Pilot to, act, to actually automate this um, because the GCSs may not identify your firmware uh, as being the same or similar to an affected firmware. Um, so the answer is definitely we, we want to work with the manufacturers to enable them to use a similar system, um, but it is not going to be trivial to be able to use this system coming off the, the main RG pilot GitHub repo um, for users that, that have their own firmware or bespoke uh, autopilots, et cetera. Does that kind of answer the question? It's it's sort of related to the thing. I've, I've quite often vendors have asked me, um, I think something like if they're using say a mission planner, how they can have uh, customized the download location for where it gets the manifest and where it gets the, um, because a, a vendor might like to validate firmwares before um, the users see it. And yes. um, so, yeah, being able to customize those URLs so you could have a, uh, if you could customize the URL for both the download and for where to get the safety bulletins, then that would give a, a better mechanism for vendors. Yeah, so the actual mechanics would be usable by anyone, but if they wanted to manage it themselves, um, they'd have to you know replicate that in their own repo and, and generate the inputs themselves or, or copy them. You could self-host the file and you could actually stick a, one of the virtual fake files in the raw MFS to be, here's my mitigation directory and here's my manifest file path. And then you can just map FTP those down as a GCS. Yeah. Fancy. So build them into raw MFS, you mean? Um, yeah, because if you're, if you're doing a custom build, then that's trivial for well, you. Well, we could build it into the APJ. I mean, the APJ has, can have URLs in it because it's just a JSON file. That's the other one is have it in right, the but APJ. That doesn't... <laughs> So the, the advantage of putting it in the actual RAMFS is that if you you don't have access to the APJ data once you're mm. just talking to a random thing from a GCS. That's true. Yeah. So if you put it in RAMFS, you know, random mission planner install can all of a sudden look it up and actually find the right host for you. That's true. Yes. And there's nothing that says you couldn't mimic your own manifest nicely, which all of a sudden means the whole UI works for you. Yes. Now that's, that sounds like a nice idea. So we could use the RAMFS embedding stuff that we've just just been adding uh to add a a file in a standard location um which would give those urls and um yeah that does sound like a very nice idea 
We need yes. to have a, a wiki page on how to do this ROMFS embedding stuff once, once that's in the stable releases. Cool. Have you got any more questions from the floor, comments? I guess I'll just say I'm, I'm, I'm really keen on the idea. It sounds, sounds like a great help, at least for, for me. You know, I do a lot of the releases and um, for Copter. And, uh, you know, when, when we have those critical problems, you know, it's always a bit, um, you know, it's always a little bit stressful you know, getting, trying to get a new version out quickly with the fixes and stuff. Um, and, and, you know, telling all the users and hoping that they actually see the messages and you just know that, you know, you know despite our forums and the, and the Facebook pages that, you know, we're only reaching 10% of our users or something like that with the issue. Um, so yeah, having something that's a little more, uh, you know, proactive uh, would be, would be really great. Yeah, I completely agree. Particularly when we want to get stuff out to them quickly when there's an urgent issue. Um, that's really important. Uh, so yeah, I, I agree. We need to do a lot better at this. Yeah, and we'll need to be able to update it as well because you know we'll we'll adjust our advice as we learn more about an issue. Um, yeah. So we'll need need to be able to update it. Yeah. Yeah. The technical we details of how we store this is is quite important too. Yeah. And how we control the, the inputs and releases to it. Um, one of the earlier slides is very much getting that that process to generate and and approve and release these um, because it's going to be as much. There's going to be as much technical input as there is process input, um, then, but it isn't just a, a technical um, document. So yeah, so we'll have to work particularly with with Trids and Randy, who are obviously uh, the releases for most of the firmwares and, and all of the critical firmwares, because Tracker doesn't really count for this type of thing. Um, to to make sure that we do get that that approval and release stuff right, both for the initial release updates and closing. Yeah, I suspect that when we do come up with our formal proposal, there'll probably be a little bit of um, back and forth with the um, developers to make sure it's a um, a process that um, people is workable and people are comfortable with. But it's also to start with, we could start adding some of the old ones in this current format, and that would give us a nice bit of test oh. data. Um, so do the last yes. three or four sort of safety bulletins that we've done and put them into this format, check that they're available. Um, we'll need a nice way of displaying them as, you know, done uh, to say that, you know, you're, you are not vulnerable to this, maybe color coded sort of green, um, but still be able to display the issues. Um, I think that'd be quite nice. And yeah, that color coding just brings up another part of this that we took out of the slides just because it, um, we thought it might distract people, but we've got a bit of time, so I'll talk about it now. Um, but that was critical, you know, severity or criticality scaling on this type of thing. So you know, you can have a green, amber, red alert type type setup if we wanted to go to that level of fidelity. Um, and turning it, you know, an issue green or moving it from a an alert or a warning to a notification, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. Do we want a sort of a rating system for how serious the issue is? Um, yeah. I don't think we distract ourselves in the first instance. I think we should get the mechanics right first and then add in some additional levels of, of detail and fidelity if we want to do that later on, if we see we need to. Um, because otherwise you can get too caught up in how you present data and forget that you actually need to get the data right first. Yes. Yes. I guess, no. you know, if we went too far, we could, we could get to the point where we're, you know, alerting users all the time of problems yeah. that, that don't apply to them. So yeah. for example, you know, like our FR sky issue, sorry, just bring that one up because it was a recent one uh, that I remember, but um, you know, a lot of people don't use FR sky. I mean, a lot of people do in some countries, but like nobody uses it or very few people use it in Japan. So you know, none of the Japan users are, should be, should be worried about that. Um, so I guess, you know, but you know, we would presumably pop up an alert to to all of them, and they'd, they'd all you know worry for a moment, and have to read some stuff in English, and then realize that it didn't really affect them. So I guess I guess I'm just saying that you know if we went too far, we could just end up annoying people. We should. Yeah, I mean, that's that. Sorry, going, James. 
I was going to say, that particular issue is one that lends itself to, um, you know, if we want to get very sophisticated with this, we can, you know, have the GCS check parameters, for instance, because that FRS guide telemetry requires parameters to be set. Um, so uh, you, you could set your GCS to check those parameters and only show the alert if the parameters were set. Um, and that would probably be the best user experience, but, I, but it's not going to be you know, the most trivial thing to implement. So it's probably not going to be step one. We, we do have a session later today in a couple of hours on the critical bugs we've had in the last year that Peter and I have put together. And we've, when we're going through that, we should think about how we would release those critical bugs, how we would have released them with this system. Um, yeah. that, that should cover all of the really critical ones that we've had. Um, just on the uh, topic of um, uh, bombarding people with information, um, something that uh, is uh, available to uh, uh, commercial operators in the UK are probably the same in the, the rest of the world. Um, the CAA has a feature whereby you can sort of um, request or opt in to certain uh, amounts of information. Um, tech, I don't know how difficult that would be technically to achieve, or is that something we could do here whereby people get emailed automatically when certain criteria are set for them? Yeah, so we, we did think about that as well, both for users and for regulators, basically for people to subscribe to this feed independently of their um, GCSs uh, and get it in a human readable form. Um, and definitely is our intent to do that. I, it's not going to be step one though. I think step one is get the right information out to the users at the time they're trying to use something to try to address the first concern, which is making sure that people don't take off with a vehicle where we know that um, it's, you know, there's a likelihood that it'll, uh, that it'll crash due to, due to an own issue. Um, the next step from that is, is getting that information out uh, either via email or, or via an RSS feed that people can subscribe to, or there's a bunch of other ways it can be done, um, both to, to users, to manufacturers of both you know, vehicles, complete systems, and, and the component manufacturers, uh, and regulators, importantly, as well. Um, because increasing our communication with the regulators and making sure that we maintain the level of trust that we've developed with those regulators we've already uh, engaged with uh, is going to be important, um, particularly over the next few years as things like UTM start to kick off in, in, some, in some jurisdictions. So we need to make sure that we do get the right information to, to those stakeholders as well. I'm um, sorry, I just, just want to add a couple more things in terms of, um, you know, possibly annoying users. Um, some users probably switch between different ground stations. So when, you know, when they're in their office, they've got mission planner for a bunch of setup. And then when they're on the field, they've got, you know, QGC running on Link or something like that. And, uh, you know, you could get the same warnings coming up in different places. Oh, damn, that damn warning again. Um, you know, uh, so just, just thinking of other ways that users could get annoyed um, and whether we could resolve that somehow, I guess. You know, one way would be to, you know, store the, I never want to see this warning again, um, state on the vehicle itself. Although I don't think that's really the right. I, that's just yeah. a, a one idea. I don't think it's a good idea. I'm just... Yeah, I, I, I do com completely understand what you're saying. It's a valid point. Um, I just don't know there's going to be a, a workable solution for that. Um, because the other issue is, is, you know, we don't want people muting all alerts um, because there's, as well as people using different GCSs, multiple GP GCSs for one vehicle, people obviously use multiple vehicles of, of one GCS. Um, so we do want some sort of persistence to, to keep reminding people because they might have different firmware versions on different vehicles, um, that type of thing. Um, so having the GCS mute and alert because it's seen at once isn't necessarily the safest thing to do. Um, yeah, there's going to be a few of those things we. I think we just try to get a solution out there, um, you know, prototype something. And then where we do have, where we, uh, through use, identify ways to improve it, um, we do that live rather than trying to solve all these problems um, in that initial prototype. Yeah, sounds good to me. Cool. Um, we've got a couple of minutes left until the um, next part. Um, 
Oh, from Francisco in the chat. Um, yeah, we did talk about like CV or CVE numbers. Um, yes, that's something we're looking at. Um, so yeah, we'll go to the final slide then and um, wrap up. So um, the plan from here is uh, first, um, we'll um, collate all the information from um, today's session. Um, I've just got a whole bunch of notes um, that I've been typing up here, which um, James and myself will go back and um, formulate a, a, more, a bit more of a detailed plan proposal. Um, so rough plan from there is sort of around May, we should have a detailed proposal for the development team. Um, then we'll work with the dev team um, and um, just resolve any issues they've got with the detailed proposal. Um, in July, we'll start um, just doing a small trial of the system, work out any bugs with the with the um, reporter and so forth and the system and the process. And um, then if all goes according to plan by October, we should be able to do a um, general release. Um, so yeah, that's that's the plan from here. Um, sort of um, James and myself have, uh, we've both volunteered to um, develop um, all, this, all this stuff, but um, of course we are happy more than happy if other people want to get um, involved as well. Um, I suspect we'll probably put something on the forums or so forth um, if people, more people want to be involved in this. And um, yeah, we'll hopefully um, have this up and running by October if all goes according to plan. Um, yeah, thank you everyone for your input and for your time. And um, yeah, that's about all from me. Um, anything from you, James? No, um, thanks everyone for, for listening and contributing. Um, and as Stephen said, we'll, we'll be developing this as, as the RD Bot way in the open. So please contribute um, where you can or where you want to as we move forward into prototyping um, through May and July. Cool. That's it. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, James and Stephen. Really appreciate that um, uh, that suggestion. I think it's a it's a great idea.